Thank you very much. Um, and um, I'll start once again by apologizing that you're sort of hearing uh, quite a lot from me this morning. I promise after this intervention I will sit and, um, and listen. Um, you already know a little bit about my views from the session uh, that we've just had. Um, but what I'll try to do is step back from the energy uh, and regulatory environment um, topic and perhaps try and speak a little bit more about uh, my uh, thinking, how, how I address as a conservative the issue of the environment and um, maybe to postulate an alternative uh, vision for conservatism to what we heard from Myron uh, in the first keynote. Um, so I will set up, in a sense, a second way of thinking, um, which uh, is very, very, hopefully, uh, very, very different. Um, so just to be uh, clear, I didn't start what I do. I didn't come at it as an environmentalist. Um, I have been called a fully paid up member of the Green Blob um, because I work on climate and clean energy. Uh, but I've also been called, and I'm very proud of this, I've also been called, well, I, I, I'm proud to have been called a climate denier by Michael Mann. Um, although I, I would, it's, it's terminology that I personally uh, don't believe I've ever used and uh, certainly would never use about anybody. It's not a helpful contribution to any uh, intellectual discussion. But what I thought I could do, since you already know what I think about cheap renewable energy and so on, is... Um, Let's talk a little bit of thermodynamics and let's talk a little bit of game theory and see if we can put a conservative approach to the environment on an intellectual footing that is frankly more interesting, more robust and more electorally palatable than simply saying that there's some red-green communist plot that has to be uh, resisted and the best way to resist it is through uh, either libertarianism or corporatism, uh, which is uh, unfortunately what we sometimes see. So starting with thermodynamics, and the reason that's important is that um, when you look at the protesters outside, uh, when you look at the, the green movement, the green left uh, confluence, they base their thesis on some actual academic work, some experts, you could call them. And first amongst them uh, is a chap called Nicholas Georgescu Rogan, who um, he wrote his magnum opus was The Entropy Law and the Economic Process. The Entropy Law and the Economic Process. What he tried to do was to argue from scientific first principles that the inevitable end point of all economic activity was degradation of the environment um, and ultimately collapse uh, and using the concept of entropy, this idea from thermodynamics that entropy always increases uh, in a system and therefore we all end up at room temperature. And um, he was hailed as a great pioneer because he corrected the flaw in previous economic theories, and it was a flaw, that said that it didn't take into account uh, the role of resources and resource depletion. Um, but he was hailed as, a, uh, as an enormous pioneer. He never won a Nobel Prize, which is interesting. I'll come back to that. Um, but it spurred an enormous amount of thinking on the left. There was, of course, uh, he wrote his great book in 1971, uh, and then there was the, uh, the Club of Rome, Limits to Growth, where they tried to actually build a, a computer model and, and show what happened. And all of this stuff was flawed because the planet is not an, in, an isolated, closed system. Energy arrives at the planet and energy, from the sun and energy leaves the planet. It's not a closed system, and so the physics is simply codswallop. Now, interestingly... Um, Georgescu had to address this by inventing what he called the fourth law of thermodynamics, which is that entropy also applies to physical materials, so that no recycling system could ever be completely robust, could never be fully circular, um, and, and therefore, once again, you arrive at this idea that the inevitable outcome of all human activity is the degradation of itself and also uh, of the environment. And the fourth law of thermodynamics postulated by Georgescu is utter and complete codswallop. 
if you have enough energy, you can re-refine and you can create order out of chaos, and we'll come back to that. So you had then the uh, limits to, uh, to growth where they essentially modeled it and they said, oh well, you know, all of the resource use grows exponentially, but the way we deal with all the problems it creates only grows linearly. Technology, according to the Club of Rome, limits to growth theory, technology grows linearly. Now this sounds hilariously funny at this point, now that we're looking at technologies uh, around uh, DNA, uh, CRISPR and other technologies, uh, you look at the IT technologies that are clearly not producing linear outcomes. They are feeding on themselves and highly dynamic and, and exponential. You had Jeremy Rifkin who wrote a book. He was so taken with Georgescu, Entropy, A New Worldview. Herman Daly, who is regarded, uh, there is a whole cargo cult of worship of Herman Daly who became a uh, World Bank economist and developed a great theory around degrowth. Degrowth. We had to somehow bring the economy to a grinding halt because that was the only way to protect uh, the planet and ensure some sort of longevity for humankind. Um, it also then spawns, of course, a whole set of regulatory responses. If you believe that the inevitable trajectory of the world is downwards, then you want to put the brakes on. It's not that there's a global plot to somehow take control of people's lives and mess with them. It's just that you're scared. You're not optimistic, you're scared, and you want to put the brakes on. And you'll do that through any mechanisms that you can, through regulatory uh, interventions, through protests, through direct action, and so on. Now, if that's all wrong and has these terrible impacts, what is the right answer? Do we just say, well, we don't like these experts, we reject all experts, and we simply, uh, because we don't like that sort of regulatory response, the clunking fist, the stuff that we spoke about in the earlier panel about state control of prices and, and three year, uh, five year plans and so on, do we then go back up the, uh, the chain of science and say there are no externalities in any of the activities uh, that we so like to indulge in, like flying around the world and having warm houses and, uh, and, and modern transportation, do we go back up the chain of science and say, well, we simply don't believe that there are bad impacts because that's the only way. If you, if you believe there are bad impacts, you then must, by this chain of thinking, you must believe we have to ram the brakes on, we have to stop doing everything, uh, slow everything down because that's the only appropriate response. Luckily, we have experts too. So instead of discrediting experts, let's look at some of ours. Ilya Prigozhin. Ilya Prigozhin won a Nobel Prize. Right? The reason Georgescu didn't win a Nobel Prize was because the fourth law of economics was cobblers. Ilya Georgescu was a proper physicist, a proper scientist, a proper expert who did win the chemistry Nobel Prize and he did so for inventing a whole field of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which led him to breakthroughs in dissipative structures. Okay? Dissipative structures are actually all about creating order out of chaos. And now perhaps the sort of links back to why we're here amongst conservatives talking about this. Order out of chaos. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like a, a good thing? Um, he proved that, of course, entropy can decrease indefinitely in a system which is not closed to energy flows. As long as the sun shines, you can keep creating order out of chaos. And the economy, of course, is nothing other than a manifestation of order out of chaos. The economy, particularly if you look at the transition to services and you look at the transition to information intensity, it is absolutely clear that we're in the business of creating order out of chaos. And this is provably feasible, and it can provably go on until such time as the sun is extinguished. It's a fantastically powerful theory. Uh, it, can, it can actually start to unlock the theory of the beginnings of life, um, and, um, and it's almost never spoken about. So Herman Daly put on a pedestal, Ilya Prigozhin almost ignored. I think this is very, uh, very wrong. So that's the thermodynamics piece of the lecture, now concluded.
But let's talk a little bit of game theory as well. Um, the tragedy of the commons, another great um, piece of expertness that has been used time and again to justify clunking interventions. If you have, it's based on uh, game theory, based on the prisoner's dilemma, where you have a situation where both sides are, have an incentive to defect, and therefore the only way to stop them doing things which, which together are unattractive. So each side um, follows a strategy which is good for itself, but when you take them together, the net is bad for both of them. And clearly, the left will say that is a justification for top-down regulatory intervention to change the payoff matrix. And uh, we see it, for instance, in climate. The, the uh, justification is, well, we need to have uh, global government because the U.S. won't do anything on climate unless China does, and China won't do it unless, uh, well, nobody will do it unless the whole world does. They will be in action, and therefore we need top-down control. So there was a, another great expert, Robert Axelrod, who um, wrote a fantastic book, very readable, called The Evolution of Cooperation. And what he said is, what happens if you play a prisoner's dilemma multiple times? If you play it once, the incentives are for both sides to defect, and you end up with very bad outcomes. But if you play the same game repeated times, both sides learn, and they learn that cooperation pays off. And so you have the evolution of cooperation. And he did this, he was a computer scientist, he ran simulations, he got people playing lots of games, and lo and behold, even though the game says that at any one time, people should defect and do co co communally stupid things. Collectively, once they start to play the game again and again, they do smart things. And of course, even something like climate, we play again and again. Unless we structure the climate negotiations, so it's a one time, sort of the, the, the view of Copenhagen, we'll have one negotiation, 50 years of implementation, of course, then you turn it into a prisoner's dilemma and the natural and correct thing to do is to defect, to say, count me out. And smart countries, Australia and so on, did exactly that. Um, but if you say, well, we're going to be negotiating these issues for the next 50 years progressively, then it becomes a repeated prisoner's dilemma and cooperation evolves. And what do we see? Actually, we do see climate action. In the absence of a clunking top-down framework, we see the US having invested massively, we see Europe having invested massively, and we see China, who was supposed to do nothing, investing more than both of those combined. That wouldn't happen if this was a pure tragedy of the commons. And of course, then another great expert, Eleanor Ostrom, who then uh, looked at specific markets where, although the left would say you have to regulate fisheries and this and that, actually, if you provide the stakeholders with the right incentives, they apply custodianship and environmental benefits ensue to them and also to others. And Eleanor Ostrom uh, also won uh, a Nobel for that work. This is really, really important. I am postulating that we don't have to, because we don't like the paradigm that we see dominating out there, that we don't have to take a step back. So we don't have to reject the arguments and say, well, we just don't believe in experts. We absolutely believe in experts. We cannot be in the business of rejecting science. We just have to be in the business of winning the arguments. The implications of this, there is no limit to growth. Every time you hear that, you have to challenge it. There are no limits to growth. And top-down regulation is by no means the only way to provide communal goods and environmental progress. And I'm delighted to say, and I'm going to plug this magazine, is full of examples of where action can be taken without top-down central control uh, and achieve some of those uh, benefits. So I think I'll probably uh, leave it there. As I, say, I could, I could uh, push it into the specifics of what that would mean in terms of policy and energy and transportation. Uh, I think we're going to discuss uh, more of that during the day. Um, but I think we have to be in the business 
of winning these arguments and discrediting that pessimistic philosophy that we were all faced with as we came into this building, we have to confront it at its roots and win those conservative arguments. Thank you.